Thank you, Rich. Um, our next speaker, thank you. Our next speaker is John Renner. John is a professor of psychiatry, director of the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship, and associate chief of psychiatry at the VA Boston Healthcare System. Uh, Dr. Renner has been referenced earlier in the day as one of, uh, one of the people that's been around here for a very long time and has really kind of uh, helped us get to where we are. So, Dr. Renner. Uh, thank you, Chris. I'm very pleased to be here, very pleased to be able to represent the VA. Uh, most of the talks we've heard today have focused on research, and I'm going to really shift the gear a little and look at how a large healthcare system uh, has tried to really implement some of these findings and try to actually directly impact care on a broad basis. VA is one of the largest healthcare systems in the country. For mental health and addictions, it may be the largest. Uh, we treat over six million people. Uh, we're the largest provider of health, of treatment training, if you will, for professionals. And I wanted to respond to one comment that Nora made earlier about the issue about psychiatrists not really learning how to deal with addictions. I, I'm, I'm very pleased to report that for the last at least 15 years, every psychiatry resident at BU has had at least two years experience managing people on methadone and people on buprenorphine. And they've all graduated with having waiver training. Uh, so I think BU has been a pioneer uh, in terms of really integrating not just, you know, a two-hour lecture, but real clinical experience so that people come, come out of that. Uh, now, I want to focus a little bit on what these problems, the addiction problems, look like within the VA. Surprisingly, in general, the, the numbers are a little bit lower in the VA uh, than they are in the rest of the country. Uh, in terms of alcohol and other drugs, that probably surprises most of you. Uh, but if you zero in on the younger group, people 18 to 25, the rates of non-medical use of pain relievers is actually higher than the rest of the country. And so we're probably looking at that subgroup of people who are recent combat vets with a lot of PTSD, probably a fair number of physical injuries and pain treatment. Uh, so it shouldn't be too surprising that that is different. Uh, now, what about adverse events? Well, you've, you've seen various versions of uh, this material here. As the prescribing goes up, the overdose deaths go up. And the veterans actually have a higher risk for overdose deaths than the rest of the country. Uh, so this, this is a problem that is having a very direct impact on our treatment system. Uh, this looks at what's gone on over the last couple of years. You can see the increase, the green line is the increase in cannabis. We haven't talked much about that today, but that's cannabis use disorder being treated in the VA system, something new we're going to have to worry about in the future. And then below that, you can see the opiate pharmaceuticals uh, and opiates are increasing as we've seen that happening all over the country. Now this article talks about how the VA responded to the system and I think if any of you are really interested in impacting a care delivery system, I think it's worth taking a look at this relatively short article it tells you what the VA did. Began with education, uh, then moved on to a focus specifically on pain management. Uh, and then got into what we called risk mitigation, and I'll talk about that in more detail, uh, and then a little bit about expanding addiction treatment. So those were the four priorities that the VA identified as their response to the, the opiate problem. So what was the dimension, if you will, of chronic pain issues within the VA? Turns out that more than 50% of older veterans complain of chronic pain. I think we saw slides earlier indicating how common pain problems are, particularly musculoskeletal pain. Uh, and that, it, I think when you think about that, it should not be surprising that there's a big connection between that and addiction. Uh, you know, what do people get their opiates for? Uh, they often come in complaining about back pain or other things. They often, over the years, have ended up with opiate prescriptions, and that has often triggered uh, the other broader problems uh, with addiction. Uh, but up to 75% of women veterans uh, have had chronic pain problems, uh, and it's the most costly disorder being treated within the VA. 
So the VA recognizes that as, as a huge problem within the system. Now, I know this slide is, is a little hard to read, but uh, if you have a magnifying glass, you can see that we're tracking what happened in the VA, uh, really starting in 2007, going up until last year, as the VA gradually uh, began to implement varying projects to try and respond to, to this. And I'll, I'll talk about these things in specifics in the next few slides. Uh, first thing, though, that I wanted to mention were clinical practice guidelines. The, the VA and the Department of Defense have had active work groups for many years now that have tried to produce really useful clinical guidelines. These are really important because they're based on actual research and they have very rigorous criteria for what qualifies as good research and then gets that translated into actual guidelines for clinical care. Uh, and you can see there they've, they've produced a management of opiate therapy for chronic pain, how to do that correctly, uh, how to manage low back pain. That was just published last year. In 2016, they published the management of substance use disorders. And that is really the most effective evidence-based guideline that currently exists for treating uh, substance use disorders. Uh, now, I want to start now beginning to show you how the VA internally looks at this problem, how they collect information and sort of monitor what's going on. And they've operated on the basis of trying to develop tools that both local management and clinicians can access that helps them see what's going on in their institution, helps them see what's happening with their individual patients, and, and permits you to compare how you're managing your patient with what the guidelines might be for managing pain or other problems with, uh, for the patients. Now, being a great bureaucracy, we love acronyms, uh, and we love to put letters together that help you think about what we're doing. This is called Stop Pain. The S stands for Stepped Care Model. Now, if you look at that bottom where you see someone walking up the stairs, that's a visual picture of what the VA has been trying to do to get people away from this reflex prescription of opioids when people complain about pain. And seeing this as a model where you can begin with interventions that don't involve medications at all, and then move up to medications that may be useful but are not addictive, and then perhaps you might ultimately end up with something that is more addictive. But you've got a whole view of how you can respond and take care of your patients without automatically uh, getting to the opiates. So you, you have to develop complementary care, you have to develop treatment alternatives, uh, you have to have these practice guidelines so people really know how to implement this, uh, and then mo prescription monitoring and academic detailing, and I'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, so the, the VA developed something called uh, the Opiate Monitoring Risk Mitigation Tools. Uh, and this was a system that was put in place that would permit the management of each system or each institution to actually track what was going on both nationally and in their own institution to know whether they were making progress in terms of reducing opiate prescriptions, reducing the type of opiates being prescribed. Uh, and, uh, and we'll also show you in a second something called STORM. That's a stratification tool for opioid risk monitoring. Uh, and that is targeted both to the institution and to the individual clinician. And, and we'll, we'll look at that in just a second here. This is what this first tool shows. If, if you are looking at it from the level of Washington or if you're looking at it from the level of your local VA medical center, you can get this kind of data. Uh, and you're, you're going to see, first of all, you know, what, what does opiate prescribing look like in, in general in your institution? And you can see here what, what's the result. And this is national data for the VA. You can see that there's been a drop. Uh, a significant drop in the general prescription of opioids in that system. If you look at the bottom square there, you're looking at the combination of opioids and benzos, 70% drop uh, in the prescription of that combination. Long-term opiates drop of 47%, and the high-dose opiates a drop of 60%. So within this time frame on these four different parameters, the VA has actually been able to track changes in the prescribing patterns uh, of their clinicians. 
And I think that coupled with giving them guidelines for alternative ways to manage these problems, I think has been a really effective way to respond to this problem. Now this, this is the storm. This is the stratification tool for opioid risk monitoring. And as I'll show you this in a second, th this zeroes down to the level of an individual patient and permits you as a clinician to know historically what, what's happened with your patient, to know what the other treatment are, options are and get a sense of whether someone has implemented it, whether you want to implement it, and how risky the patient is at this point in terms of what criteria does the patient meet that might put them in a category of someone you should be very concerned about. Uh, and th this is zeroing in and gives you a little closer sense of what's going on. You see that thermometer. Uh, that measures the risk. Uh, very high active opiate treatment risk. And you can see here, depending on the criteria, what, you know, for instance, if you uh, were getting both combinations of opioids and benzos, your risk is going to be higher. If you're on a high potency opiate, your risk is going to be higher. Uh, so there are various factors that are built into this system. This system is driven by monitoring the VA record system. It's updated every 24 hours. Uh, so if someone somewhere within the system has written a different prescription for one of your patients, that may show up by a change in this the next day when you go to look at this dashboard. Uh, you can see on the right it gives you lists of sort of what are, on one hand, risk mitigation strategies uh, and then non-pharmacologic strategies for treatment. And you can see th this is a hypothetical patient, but you can see various boxes are checked off because the patient has been given this or not given that. Uh, and it also s acts as a visual stimuli to the clinician uh, in case there may be things or interventions that they have not been thinking of uh, that they might consider implementing for their patient. And again, this, this data is visible to the clinician specific to the patient that they may have sitting right in front of them. You know, and it's updated every 24 hours. Uh, so it's, a, I think, a very powerful technological feedback tool uh, to, to help you have, a, have an impact on your, on your clinical practice. Uh, now, the VA also has pushed very hard to have all of us participate in the, the uh, prescription drug monitoring programs. Uh, and you can see here they're tracking the uh, participation, the VA directives to do that. Uh, and you can see as the, as the participation has gone up, the number of prescriptions have gone down. Now, I don't know whether that is something else has driven that because the VA was doing a lot of other things at the same time, but at least that uh, is one element of, of what we think has been an important part of the program. Uh, now, you've heard, we've heard multiple references to naloxone today. Uh, th this looks at what the VA has been doing uh, with prescribing naloxone. Uh, and here you can see around the country uh, how effective they have been in terms of implementing it. Uh, the VA, uh, you know, we, we have the benefits of not being forced to charge people. Uh, we've been very liberal. We're, we're giving the prescriptions to the patient. We'll give them to their family. Uh, if you use yours, you can get new ones. I, one of my buprenorphine patients has gone through two kits in the last three months. Uh, and in both situations, one was he was at a Celtics game and somebody overdosed in the lobby of the garden. Uh, and about a, a month later, he was getting on the train at North Station and the same thing happened. So, so he, he didn't use the kits on himself uh, and he didn't even know the people that he, that he used. But uh, I, I think it's a you know, nice example of how powerful an intervention uh, something like this can be. And, and the VA has been very supportive in terms of implementing that. Now, th this again is, is sort of look, going back, sort of looking at trends in the, the veterans receiving clinical care for opiate use disorders. And you can see these numbers are going up. Uh, the VA has expanded treatment. Uh, one of the things that the VA has done is to try to implement very directly the notion that everyone in addiction treatment should have access to medication treatment. I, I find it hard to switch my tongue, Rich, <laughs> get, get away from MAT, uh, but we'll try. <laughs> 
Uh, but the, it you know, is now formal policy within the VA that any VA addiction treatment program should accept someone on methadone or buprenorphine or naltrexone. Now, I wish I could say that that's actually what's happening. Now, uh, I, I think it's an, at this point it's an aspirational goal. Uh, I think most of the larger programs have been able to implement it. Uh, but I think one of the things that, that has been percolating in the background in our discussion today is you know, how difficult it is to change people's behavior and change people's attitudes. Uh, and people in the recovery program are often highly wedded to whatever model of therapy that they have engaged in for long periods of time. And we've found that it certainly has, you know, the simple directive saying, okay, you should start accepting people on methadone in your therapeutic community. No, not easy, not easy. It takes time. Uh, but, I, but I think we're being pointed in the right direction, and I think we're making significant progress. And I'm, I'm optimistic that with the injectable formulations of buprenorphine that we're now going to have something that will probably make it easier uh, for some of the residential programs to accept people on medication. Uh, they haven't been able to do that before. Uh, now, just lastly, th this is a slide that uh, is trying to sing the praises of medication for treatment. I'm not going to focus on this because this, I think the audience has been converted today already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And, uh, this, this is just an example of the, the VA's effort to expand the treatment for injectable naltrexone. Uh, we have lots of patients now who are on naltrexone. I've been able to convince the nurses in our methadone clinic that uh, they can give that shot without much difficulty, and they've actually found become quite comfortable doing it. Uh, and you can, you can see that we're, we're making progress with that. Uh, th this... Uh, is just a general sense of how the VA has expanded the use of buprenorphine, naltrexone, and methadone. Uh, the last data that we have on buprenorphine, which is for the last six, month, uh, six months of 2017, we had almost 22,000 people in the VA who were on regular buprenorphine treatment. Uh, so I think that we're, we're really moving quite a, uh, progressively doing that. And then lastly, uh, I just wanted to mention academic detailing. Uh, I, I, I assume most of you are familiar with what this is, but it was basically an attempt to get the professional pharmacy services within the VA to take over the role that had been occupied in the past by drug companies. You know, so, you know, the VA no longer permits people from drug companies to show up in our office and try and market their products. But what they've done is develop a very sophisticated approach uh, using their own staff to visit the clinicians, to help them review their practice patterns, to give them various tools for both educating their patients and themselves. Uh, for instance, I get visited every once in a while and someone's concerned about how often I prescribe benzos or how I'm prescribing opiates and I'll get pamphlets to give to my patients and things to educate me and make it easier uh, to go ahead uh, and implement changes. And I think I can stop at that point. Thank you. Do we have any quick questions for Dr. Renner? Do you have any idea or a wild guess as to how much of the unused opioids that were returned would have found their way into the street or into some participant in, in an overdose? Since obviously those people mailed them back, so they were never going to use them yeah. and they weren't uh, addicted. I, I have no idea. No, I'm, and I'm not aware of anybody who's actually collecting that information or, or has any awareness of it. Thank you.